Good morning, church. How lovely to be with all of you this morning, those who are joining in person and those who are joining at home or elsewhere, perhaps on vacation. It's good to have you here as part of the community. Um, I want to welcome both of these lovely communities and those who may be arriving perhaps online for the first time. This is a community that is committed to inclusivity, to respect and generosity and care. And I'm very grateful uh, to have gotten to share time in this community for the past year. My name is Amy Haynes, and uh, I was the pastoral care minister here at St. David's, um, and I will always hold that as a special uh, role. I took the name placard for the door. I've never had one of those before, so I'm taking it with me. And whatever else happens, I was at least once for one year official at something. So, very good. How wonderful, again, to see you here, and how wonderful to see you, Ruth, sling free, ready to light some candles. We've had quite the candle relationship over the past year, and I'm excited to invite you up so we can do our candle lighting together and pray together. Make it count. <laughs> All right. Let's pray as we light our affirming candle. God of infinite manifestations, free us of shame that confines and judgment that destroys. Bring healing to the wounds of being told that we are too big or too much, too feminine or too butch, too young or too old or too queer. Ground us in the truth and reality that sets us free. We are each the work of a divine hand. What beautiful work. The holy lives and dwells within our flesh. Wherever we struggle to believe that, meet us there. Move our bodies this day and every day with joy and purpose. Now we'll light our Treaty 7 and Métis Region 3 candle and pray this prayer together. May our footsteps on these ancient lands remind us of creation and connectedness in our search for truth. May the majestic evergreen from its roots to its branches remind us to dig deep and reach high in our action for justice. May the eagle hawk and osprey who soar in the sky remind us of the power in our call for love. May the expanse of the lands and rivers of Treaty 7 and Métis Region 3 of the sky and the stars remind us of God's vastness in our faith, in hope. And may the Holy Three, Creator Spirit, Lord God, Brother Jesus, remind us of community. And finally, this morning, we light our Christ candle, remembering the one who was God and fleshed among us here on earth and who is still with us, Jesus, light of the world. So this summer, uh, we are engaged in a series and we are focusing on using the time to turn and reorient ourselves towards the holy. What we pay attention to is what we are formed by. 
So let us continue in this summer season to listen and to practice hearing that still small voice and finding our truest of selves, that which God has created us to be. The wisdom tradition in our faith within Christianity invites us to love knowledge, especially self-knowledge that comes from examining ourselves in relationship to the liberating word of God. One way we can practice this is by doing Lectio Divina, that's divine reading. It's an ancient tradition of mixing the reading of scripture with prayer and thoughtful meditation. So rather than analyzing the words of scripture, it's a way for us to allow the words to just be themselves, to be present and to live within us. What will we hear when we let go of what the words are supposed to mean and just simply let them reside within us? So you're invited at this time to just sit quietly in the silence without any expectation of what you are supposed to be thinking. Don't worry about any sounds you might hear either from outside or from inside. Just let them float in and out of your attention. And if you do find it hard to settle, contemplate the following. Perhaps consider time, the time we spend solving, fixing, figuring out. What about simply just letting things be for a minute? It is so often the most needed space for a breakthrough. I do love a silent retreat. We could just do this until 1130 if you want. <laughs> Let us pray together. For that which then I thought was right. For that which now I regret. For the times I know not what to do. Come and rest. Come and listen. Know that grace and guidance surround you at each and every moment that we turn to receive.
Let us uh, bring that restful peace into our singing together. And um, you all know what song it is because you have the bulletin and I do not. Um, so I forget which one I, is coming up next. 109. In more voices. Let's sing that one together and make a joyful noise. Thank you, love. Our conversation time now, grateful for finding our way, learning something new, and uh, thirsting for God, which is what I want to talk about. I'm going to come around this way. Um, I want to read a little bit from a book that I have been really thoroughly enjoying. It's called uh, Crisis Contemplation, Healing the Wounded Village. And... Um, I have been um, quenched by this book, speaking of our thirsts. And um, I'm going to read a little bit from here and there, focusing on the idea of crisis, lament, and what it is to cry out to God, to thirst for God, and to listen for the response. First quote I want to read is uh, from the author uh, from another book she um, wrote called Joy Unspeakable. The moan is the birthing sound, the first movement toward a creative response to oppression, the entry into the heart of contemplation through the crucible of crisis. In every crisis, there is a message. Crises are nature's way of forcing change, breaking down old structures, shaking loose negative habits so that something new and better can take their place. We certainly have faced so many crises recently, and it does seem like whether in our time or biblical times, the world is always on the brink of ending, and yet beautifully, defiantly, lovingly refusing to end. So I want to talk about what the author goes through here in how we might contemplate our way through crisis. I offer here a few examples of how crisis contemplation might be experienced. There is a sense of ineffability that follows the rupture, letting go, free fall, and darkness. Words are useless, will not come to mind, and even if are available to us, would be of no use. Since the context for crisis is communal, those in the midst of despair want to feel the comfort and presence of those around them. 
yet their circumstances will not allow them to communicate in usual ways. Here are a few key factors that may arise during crisis contemplation. The eclipse, the moan, and the stillness on the eclipse, she says. There is no chance that we will fall apart. There is no chance. There are no parts. In her clear, everyday voice, poet June Jordan affirmed the wholeness of everything as a reliable platform of reality. No matter how fractured things seem to be, no matter how the crisis splinters our delusions, there is a solid foundation within and beneath us, beside and between us. We can depend on this wholeness when it is experienced as a dark night of the soul for individuals or an eclipse of the ordinary for communities. An eclipse occurs when one object gets in between us and another object and blocks our view. From Earth, we routinely experience two types of eclipses, an eclipse of the moon and an eclipse of the sun. Of course, the scientific Explanation is more detailed and comprehensive, but for our purposes, what matters most about an eclipse is the sense of temporary absence. We are not permanently blocked from the light. Also, we are not able to rely on our sight to overcome the obstruction. The eclipse reminds us to linger in the darkness, to savor the silence, to embrace the shadow for light is coming, the resurrection is afoot, transformation is unfolding, for God is working in secret and silence to create us anew. And this renewal will require our rebirthing. So we come to the moan. The moan is that utterance that communicates the ineffability of the crisis the need to connect to others nearby, and our dependence on a groaning Holy Spirit. We moan to give birth, to tra traverse nonlinear time, and to signal movement from one state of being to another. We moan as a sign of life, to give notice to spiritual bystanders that what looks like an ending is actually a beginning. In a similar fashion, the Holy Spirit groans the prayers for us that we cannot utter while the crisis continues. And then comes the stillness. In the stillness of quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper of the heart giving strength to weakness, courage to fear, hope to despair. Silence is helpful, but you don't need it in order to find stillness. Even when there is noise, you can be aware of the stillness underneath the noise, of the space in which the noise arises. That is the inner space of pure awareness, of consciousness itself. After the eclipse and the moan comes the stillness. Stillness and silence are not the same. One can be enfolded into the other in ways that enhance the benefits of both, and yet they are not the same. Stillness is a state of wholeness, an antidote to fragmentation. I invite you just to savor the words and find in there some truth as we, as the blessed community, as church, think about what our faithful response might be to the times in which we live. Each of us will have to listen for the voice of God. Each of us will have to be still and to moan and to moan on behalf of those who cannot even utter a moan. It's important work to be church. And it's so much more than Sunday morning, and so I invite you into that work. And I 
pray that it is fruitful and beautiful and messy and blessing for all of you and all whom you will touch. Our first reading today is Psalm 46, verses 1 to 7. 
God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea, when its waters roar and rage, when the mountains shake because of the surging waves. There is a river whose streams gladden God's city, the holiest dwelling of the Most High. God is in that city. It will never crumble. God will help when morning dawns. Nations roar, kingdoms crumble. God utters God's voice, the earth melts. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. And now a reading from Proverbs 1, verses 20 to 23. Wisdom shouts in the street. In the public squares, she raises her voice. Above the noisy crowd, she calls out. At the entrance of the city gates, she has her say. How long will you clueless people love your naivete? Mockers hold their mocking dear, and fools hate knowledge. You should respond when I correct you. Lord, I'll pour out my spirit on you. I'll reveal my words to you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, O God, for you are my rock and refuge. Lead me to life everlasting. And if I should falter in offering a word, reflecting the goodness and the mercy and the vastness of the God we serve, then my prayer this morning is that you will see more of God and less of me. Beloveds, I am so struck uh, by the thought of wisdom shouting above a cacophony of the ignorant in the streets. I wonder how will she be heard? How will we the ignorant, because let us not mistake that that is us. We often think the ignorant are those that think other than we do, but no, we are all in that group. How will we attune ourselves to hear the prophetic above the din of the crowd? How will we, even if we hear the prophetic, choose to heed the words and the message when we are so afflicted by the deadly comfort of nostalgia for what was or what used to be, or the luring illusion of our own naivete. This is where it's so interesting today that I get to talk to you about these things. I'm so excited. Um, to have a chance to reflect on this because I didn't choose the scripture and I didn't choose the topic. I found myself in it. And I think the holy is working always in secret to guide us to things that are important for us to reflect on. And I think about this topic a lot because I'm trying to heed a call a call that I believe comes from God to do this kind of work and to listen faithfully and to sort out what is ego and what is true and what is humility and what is false modesty. So these are all things that I think we have to wrestle with in our own call because it's not just the preacher or the pastor who is called, but all of us as Christian people have a call. And so this idea of contemplation is important for all of us. How do we 
contemplate? How do we hear wisdom? I think like anything else that we are good at, we have to practice. And so many of us don't know where to begin. Surprising to me, uh, as someone who is relatively new to our faith, to hear so many people who have grown up in faith say, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to meditate. I don't know how to hear God. And I think that it's important that we practice. I think of a loud train going fast and people are shouting and tired and swearing and maybe somebody is acting in a way that makes us uncomfortable or pushes on our prejudices. I also think of a protest in the city square where shouts live next to sirens and cries and people who don't smell good and people who aren't like us. Would we have the wherewithal in all of that to tune in to what wisdom might be saying there? This makes me think about this mention in both of these passages of the city and the city gates. Now, those of you who love Bible study will know that the city gates are more than just the setting. This is telling us something. The city gates in the Bible always talk about where the prophetic word is being heard. This is where prophets do their thing, is at the gates entering into the city or exiting out of the city. And I think that's really interesting because that's the margin. That's the edge of the city. It's not embedded in. It's on the edge of. And so when we listen for prophetic words, let us attune ourselves to the edges, to the margins, to those who we may think we know more than. Because perhaps there is an opportunity for us to broaden our experience of the holy. I also think when listening and, and reflecting on these scriptures about how God tells us we should respond when we are corrected. Proverbs, if you have read it, is full of good advice and correction for our stupid behavior. Um, <laughs> and it's easy to read Proverbs and think, well, they're talking to that person over there that's annoying me, but no, we are, we're all included. So uh, if you ever need a talking to, read Proverbs. Um, <laughs> and you will soon find yourself contrite and ready to move on uh, in a good way, hopefully. You should respond when I correct you, says God. I will pour out my spirit onto you. I will reveal my words to you. This is what the scripture says. And my dear beloved community of faithful people, I implore you, I implore us, that when that holy wind kicks up to move us, to correct us, to set us on a path. We do not close the window thinking it's just an annoying breeze. It's easy to think we know. We learn most when we listen. And we all have the holy dwelling within us that's begging to speak. So I invite you into that place where you can hear and recognize and practice holiness every day in your regular life. And I hope that as we walk on that path together, we will see each other once again and recognize that the holy lives in you as it lives in me and that we are menders and co-creators of this beautiful 
kingdom of God that breaks out in corners where you would never expect it to. It surprises us with people we never thought we would know and love and reveals itself in loving, compassionate ways. I look at uh, all of you, some of you who I know a little and some of who I know a little better than that, and I feel overcome, actually, with so much love uh, for you. And I'm so grateful uh, for the love that you have shared with me. It has truly been a balm and a healing. Um, let us continue to walk in a good way, sharing that love, opening up the walls of our community so that we may see the blessed other in our midst and not only welcome them, but celebrate them and maybe even let them stand in the pulpit. <laughs> Bless you all, and um, thanks be to God for this wonderful gift that we share of faith. Amen. We get to sing. Be Thou My Vision. It's a classic. This one I know you know. <laughs> so let's sing it in a good way. Stand as you are able and uh, lift up your voices. Just basking in that a little. That felt really good. Um, so let us pray together. And uh, 
Our prayer of thanksgiving and petition today will be brief because how ironic to go on and on in the midst of a sermon and reflection about contemplation. So I'll say this, prayer is simple. It is like quietly opening the door and slipping into the very presence of God. There in the stillness to listen to God's voice, perhaps to petition, or perhaps only to listen, it matters not. Just to be there in God's presence is prayer. And so I say words written by Meister Eckhart in the 13th century, if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, that would suffice. So thank you, God. Thank you for life. It's mystery. It's heartache. It's blinding beauty. Thank you for relationships that teach us and mold us and comfort us. Thank you for mercy. Mercy that we never have to struggle to earn, but that is given freely to us. Thank you for forgiveness that unburdens us and sets us free whether we receive it or we give it. Thank you for wisdom that rains down on us, imploring us to listen, to heed, to stand corrected. Thank you for being so near to us, you are even closer than our next inhale. We pray a blessing on all people, those who hear my voice, those who cannot. We pray comfort for those who struggle with their health, with their finances, with their relationships, with their faith. We pray, God, for those who are sick, for those who are dying, for those who have gone to be with you and those who remain to mourn. We lift up all the prayers in our hearts that are moans too deep for our words. We offer them to you knowing that your Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf to guide us and to comfort us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of our petition and praise we lift up and pray together the way your son, love incarnate, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I now recognize a time of offering, um, knowing that many of you choose to give in ways that are outside of uh, this time, that are um, online or in person, I just offer this invitation to you all to bring your warmth and your generosity to the mission of this church by saying that we are expressions of divine love. 
we answer prayers when we care for our communities and when we listen and watch for the word of wisdom and the activities of God in the world. With prayerful spirits, we gather all those offerings up so that God's kingdom may come. And over those gifts we pray. Holy Spirit, forgive us when we have not been able to recognize the path towards solidarity. Forgive us for when we have not been able to relate to our neighbors with compassion. Forgive us for the prejudices that still have a hold on our hearts. May our offerings today be a sign of our desire to stand corrected, to listen for your blessed, disruptive wind, and to do the work required of holy love. Amen. And so we go into our time of announcements. Um, the announcements today are as follows. <laughs> Uh, there is a labyrinth walk at the Silver Springs Botanical Garden. Um, it's Tuesday morning at 9.30, so there's details, as I understand it, in the weekly email, or you can reach out to Na Reverend Nancy. Um, additionally, the Flat Jesus and the prayer wall will continue uh, through the summer. I have an announcement here from the lovely Sally Hodges, and I'll read it. It says... The annual Memorial Lantern event is two weeks away. Come and join the crowd on Saturday, August 6th at 7 o'clock and enjoy watching the floating lanterns and hearing from prominent Calgarians. This year, the Lantern Committee was privileged to be given space in the Central Public Library to bring forward the topic of peace. We are still looking for singers who would like to join a small choir. The first would be at 2 p.m. Um, the first rehearsal, pardon me, is today at 2 p.m. at Sally Hodges' house. Come and support the cause of peace. Um, additionally, uh, the Lantern event is at Olympic Plaza. And that is from Sally with grateful thanks. And luckily, I'm not five years younger because I don't think people could read cursive anymore. I even struck, I was like, oh, I haven't read cursive for a good long while. Thank you for... Uh, getting me back in track there. So I think um, there was an additional announcement that I don't have in front of me regarding the uh, bread event that happens at Northminster. Does anyone happen to know those details off the top of their head to share? Oh, see? Ta-da! <laughs> How wonderful. Yes, the bread event uh, coming up at um, Northminster, and this really helps to prevent food waste. So if you can pop by and grab a loaf of bread, that's a good chance to meet up with others and, uh, you know, make toast, which is the best food ever. So, uh, Also, additionally, there is uh, no coffee during the summer, um, but you can definitely visit as, as you leave. So, um, you know, visit until your throat gets dry and then you can <laughs> go on your way. So I have a blessing here uh, that uh, is for, for me to say over you and know that uh, in this written blessing I offer uh, so many other unspoken blessings on top of it. I have been really blessed to be with you all uh, today and, and each day that I've been able to be with you. So let me say this. And now as you move on into the world, Hold that which is happening on the outside and on the inside dear to you. Love what comes across your path for what it will teach you. Cherish the struggle that stirs in your gut for how it will guide you. And know that all people carry within them the essence of the divine, a holy wisdom given at birth. Listen and listen and listen every day until we all meet again. Get quiet enough to hear the still small voice and to find your own. And may the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer be with you all. And so all of God's people say, amen. And I think we're gonna sing a blessing as well. So let's do that.
Yeah. <laughs> 